And Peter was grieved because he said unto him a third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said unto him, Then feed my sheep. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for the uh, morning we've had already. Thank you for the opportunity that every one of this youth group has had, Lord, just to serve you uh, for the last few minutes, Lord. And no doubt, uh, I have faith, Lord, that you will continue to speak uh, through the words you've given me, through the scripture you've given all of us, Lord. I pray that you'll continue to uh, open our hearts and our spirits to be uh, mindful, Lord, of all that you have to tell us, Lord. Thank you for everyone of the, uh, everyone in this room, God. I just pray that you'll continue to send your spirit down. I say this in this humble name, Lord. Amen. God be seen. So, let me tell you guys a story. About two years ago, I almost died about eight times in one day. <laughs> what I'm talking about is I had a lifeguard training class that I had to take part in. Now, has anyone ever thought about doing lifeguarding? Or has anyone ever done it? Because let me tell you right now, Training to be a lifeguard is 10 times harder than being a lifeguard. Because you get to the lifeguard training, it's March, it could be warmer, but it's not, it's cold. And the first thing they tell me is, you gotta jump in the pool and you gotta prove to me that you can even be a lifeguard. Okay, how hard can it be? You know, swim a couple laps, maybe rescue a couple people, right? But no, they wanted me to spend 12 laps in the pool. That's 300 meters, it's like a quarter mile of swimming. And I'm sitting there going, I haven't swum in probably a year, but okay, I'll, I'll give it another shot. You know, I, I gotta do it, do it for the kids, you know? So I jump in the pool, I'm swimming, I'm halfway through, and I start getting passed. On my left, passed on my right by all these girls. And I'm like, what is going on here? Turns out there's about 20 girls from a swim team not too far from here, okay? And of course they can swim a quarter mile like it's nothing. So they finish in about 20 minutes. And here I am, and I think it's me and one other guy. And we are just dying. I mean, I'm seven, eight laps in. I feel my arms just giving out. My legs are just dragged behind. It, it's terrible. And I can, I can hardly even wait to get to the finish. So there's the first time I about died, just swimming those laps. Then here's what my uh, instructor said. He said, all right, you did great. You, you finished. 30 minutes, hey, we're not judging, okay? You did finish. He says, now here's the next thing you got to do. You got to go jump in the deep end. I'm like, oh, goodness. He says, you're going you're gonna to sit there, and you have to tread water for two minutes. Okay, that's, I, can, I can float for two minutes, right? But he says, no, you can't use your arms. You have to put your arms under your uh, armpits, and you got to tread water with your feet. I'm sitting here going, oh, I'm asking God, please give me strength to finish this off. Two minutes. Now, I feel like time is speeding up the older I get, and I'm told by everyone that that's the truth. So I imagine that as I grow older, it's going to get faster. But if you ever want to slow time down, watch this. Jump in the pool and try to tread water for two minutes with just your legs. I promise you, time slows down. I thought I was in there for 30 minutes again. And I look at the clock, it's been a minute and a half. I got 30 more seconds. So I finally get done with that. And then, bless his heart, the, 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 not the professor, but the teacher, he had one more thing for us to do. He took the worst part of the first training and the worst part from the second activity in this training, and he put them together. I don't know what he was thinking. He said, now you're going to swim a lap. When you get to the deep end, you got to dive to the bottom and get a brick off the bottom. Bring the brick back up. And then using only your legs, because you got the brick in your hands here, you have to paddle that brick back to the shallow end and rescue a brick. <laughs> Again, almost died doing that. And then, you know, after that, you throw in a couple times where you're sitting at the bottom of the, of, of the pool waiting for someone to come, uh, you know, rescue you. And you're literally pretending to die so they can save you. And it, it was just a crazy day. It, it was crazy. And it's on my mind, really, because in a couple weeks, I've got to go back and recertify, so I'm not looking forward to that again. But, needless to say, all right, in all of this, I started thinking, what 
is my purpose? What's my job here on earth? And obviously, the first job is lifeguarding. You know, that I, I serve at a summer camp, so lifeguarding is part of the job description. Many people here work in manufacturing jobs or construction, uh, accounting, insurance. You work with numbers. Uh, each of us has a job here on earth. But I started thinking about it from a more spiritual side of things. And I decided to pose a question this morning, looking at things from God's perspective. I'm going to ask the question, what business are you in? Hmm. What business are you in? I chose this first scripture because I think that Jesus gives three answers, uh, three responses to Peter's answer, but each one carries a different idea of what business Jesus expects Peter and all of his disciples, including us today, to be in as we serve him. So the first thing that I want to look at here is in very first uh, verse 15 here. Jesus tells Peter, Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. And I know we all said that, Lord, we love you. But Peter, but, but Jesus has a response for us. When we say we love him, he says, then feed my lambs. Right here in verse 15, feed my lambs. So because each of these answers is so similar, if you go back to the original text, the, the Greek version of the Bible that, that John himself wrote so many years ago, what we see is that word feed has a, a bigger meaning than it does just, just using the word feed. The idea of that word in, in, the, in the Greek text is an idea of pasturing that lamb. And by pasturing, it means to care for them, to give them every, um, every need that they have. So you give them the food, give them the water. You're, you're taking care of them, you're caring for that lamb. The idea of that, ladies and gentlemen, is let me tell you, there are lost lambs all over the world. That's right. And what business are we in? We're in the rescuing business. First point this morning is we are in the rescuing business because we are called to take God's word to those lambs, those lost sheep that are out in the world that do not have a church family, that do not have a close personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We're in the rescuing business. When I was learning uh, to be a lifeguard, I was taught something really interesting, and I think it applies quite well to uh, a Christian's life. The first thing they told me, which sounds crazy, is they said, you're not rescuing anyone. And I said, what? I'm, a, I'm in lifeguard training. It says on the job description to save people. They said no. They said, let me explain why you're not the one doing the rescue. If you're swimming towards a drowning victim, the only thing that victim is thinking about as he's sinking lower and lower into the water is he's thinking, I need to float. And he sees a person floating towards him. What's he going to do? He's going to wrap his arms around that lifeguard as tight as he can. And if that lifeguard is not ready, what's going to happen is that lifeguard is going to be pulled underwater with the victim. They say, no, you don't rescue anyone. You take your lifeguard flotation device, you've got your lifeguard tube with you, or one of those little ring tubes that you see. You throw them that tube, you take that tube and you push it into them. You give it to them and they'll grab the tube. That too, ladies and gentlemen, is what's saving that person. They're sinking deeper and they need that. They need to grasp onto that too. Ladies and gentlemen, let me show you what we take the lambs that are lost in the world. We take them the scriptures. We take them Jesus Christ, who promises that he will give them a hope and a future. He will save them from their sin as they sink deeper and deeper into what the world has to give them. We take those lambs, the scriptures, ladies and gentlemen. We, on our own, we cannot save anyone. And I can promise you that because the moment you think that you yourself can save someone is the moment you begin sinking down with them. So take the scripture to those lost lambs. And then, 
beyond that, I think it's so interesting that Jesus gives us this story before the before the discussion, the little story about them fishing, because it's so interesting. We see that these disciples who have been saved for a while, but have not been for more than a couple years. What do they do when they are sitting alone in a room? They go fish. Now, how often are we guilty of being in ministry or serving God for a few years and we start getting burnt out? These disciples here, they needed to be rescued because they were overwhelmed emotionally. Can you imagine serving for three years or so when Jesus Christ himself, you've been doing nothing but serving the Lord for those three years. Can you imagine how exhausted these disciples are? And then all of a sudden, your Lord and Savior dies. Three days later, he rose again. And emotionally, that has to be absolute chaos for them. They, they have to be thinking through so much. And here we are. I, I love Peter here. Because when you read the King James Bible, it sounds like he's from South Carolina. All right? I love this. He says, y'all, I go fishing. i got to get out of here. I go fishing. He is so overwhelmed that he goes back to what he used to do. He takes a step away from, from, from his purpose, and he goes back to the life he used to live as a fisher. How often do we do that? Ladies and gentlemen, what we need is to go out into the world and rescue. Stay focused on that job, because what we see Jesus do here is he comes to the disciples. He comes to them as they're walking further and further away. They're out fishing. Jesus comes to them. And he says, no, you need to come back to me. Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our first business here on earth. But we have a second business. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the investing business. What do I mean by the investing business? Well, once again, we're going to look back at the Greek text of scripture here to understand what Jesus means when he says, tend my sheep. Now in the King James Bible, he uses the word feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. The idea of that word, when you look back at the original Greek text, is more of a leadership, a supervising role. A shepherd is constantly leading the sheep. Let me tell you the number one thing that effective leadership takes is the ability to invest your time, your energy, your resources. Invest your all in leading. The idea, ladies and gentlemen, is that we are leading each other and we're leading closer to God. So what we see here is the idea. He says, go and tend my sheep. Now, I read a, a really interesting story uh, from the Middle East, uh, and this happened a few years ago. This is a true story, actually. What happened was there was a group of about uh, 1,500 sheep, I guess you call it a flock of sheep, and they were being tended to by uh, a, a group of shepherds from a nearby village. Now, in, imagine being, if you will, out in the middle of the field. You've been there all day. You're tired. You, you have stuff that you want to do for yourself back in, back in the city, back in the village. And these sheep are fine. They're, they're all here. We haven't had a problem in a little while. So these shepherds, and I can imagine exactly what they're thinking, they left their 1,500 sheep out in this field all by themselves so they could go and do their own thing. They stopped investing their time and their energy into their flock. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you what happens to those sheep. Those sheep, in the absence of a strong leader or leaders, started looking to themselves. They started looking to the sheep around them. Now, when we start looking at the world around us, instead of the God we serve, let me tell you, there will be some disaster that will take place in our lives when we do that. These sheep look to their own people for leadership in the absence of a strong leader. 
And it took one sheep that started straying off of the path that they were used to. And the sheep took a dark path, a way that the shepherds would never, ever take their sheep. This dark path led them off, and at the end of it was a cliff. And the sheep didn't see it, and that first sheep, he took a step right off the edge. 1,499 other sheep took that same step off the edge because they weren't being led. They went right off the end, and when those shepherds returned, they had lost well over half of their flock, and the rest were heavily wounded. That entire village lost all of their uh, income financially through those sheep. They lost it because of a few careless shepherds that didn't lead their sheep. Let's look back at this scripture here. Because I think it's so interesting that, again, Jesus gives this example in the previous text of a group of men who is lost. They're confused and they don't know what they're doing. It's so interesting here that he asks his disciples, who, mind you, have been fishermen their whole lives, you got them to meet? And they answered him, no. Now they've been fishing all night. And they haven't caught a single fish. Now, Jack Sharp, I'm sure you could agree with me here. Uh, Scott Sanders, if you fish all night and you don't catch a single fish, that's not the best night for you, I'd imagine. Now, what would we see Jesus do? Well, Jesus comes to these disciples. And mind you, they're already straying away from Jesus. As we talked about, they've taken a step away and they're going fishing instead of serving the Lord. And he comes and he begins to instruct them. He tells them, cast your net on the right side of the ship. Again, that's the idea. Cast it on the far side. Cast it over there. And you will find. What do you find? Go find the fish that you've been looking for all night long. Ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine what these disciples thought? They say to themselves, this man that I don't know is over there on the shoreline and he's trying to tell me how to do my job. That's not what the idea was. The idea is that Jesus was coming to lead them. In their time of need. He led the disciples and told them, cast your net on the far side. And what does it say happens? It says that they, in, in verse 6, they, therefore, uh, they were not able to draw the net for the multitudes of fish. Jesus led them. He led them in the right direction. They found the fish. More importantly, he calls them back to shore. And that's what ushers in this whole discussion of what they're to do, what business they're in. Ladies and gentlemen, our, our job is now to pour into others the truth that we have, to invest in each other. Because when you look around this room, we see a lot of Christians that oftentimes, including myself, are in need of a leader who's going to invest in. And we are called to lead each other in the right direction. And if you don't believe me, there's a group of people right here that has been poured into and has been invested in for the last few weeks. And I want, to, I want you to see the fruits of that. Because this youth group right here, the youth leaders, Jason, and all of the youth that have helped bring these youth to the stage this morning, they have been investing their time their energy, their weekends, their Wednesday nights and their Sunday nights, when they could be doing anything else to satisfy their own uh, interests and needs, but instead, they invested their time in these uh, young men and women right here. And we've all seen what that results in. Because we've all been touched this morning, just in the last few days, by the songs that have been sung by this amazing youth group. And I gotta tell you, up till now, I, I hadn't seen it, but now I'm glad I have because it is a blessing to see this youth and to see how strong they are. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the rescue business. We're in the investment business, but there's one more business that we all take part in. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the construction business. What do I mean by construction business? Look around the room at the church. 
This is our responsibility. We are called to expand and build the church. What does Jesus say? Once again, he asks Peter the same question he's asked twice already. He says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter, do you love me? For the third time he asked this. And Peter is grieved, it says here in the King James. He's grieved. Because I can't imagine. He's sitting here. He's answered Jesus twice. And he knows, and he says it. He knows, Jesus, thou knowest all things. He says in verse 17, thou knowest that I love thee. He can't imagine why Jesus is asking a third time. But, but here's why. Because Jesus had one more thing to say. He says, once again, for the third time, he says, be my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now, once again, we'll go back to the Greek. The word feed here is just like the word that he said when he said, feed my lambs. Pasture my sheep. Take care of their needs. Take care of everything. Their food. You feed them. You give them the water that they need to survive. You're caring for those sheep. Now, he changed the word, though. He said, feed my sheep, not feed my lambs. Because now... You're not just feeding those lambs. You're not just taking care of the young ones. We're taking care of everyone. We're feeding all men, all people, all the sheep of the flock. That's everything from, this, from the youth group, even, even before that, to, to the youngest kids in the nursery, who right now, there are people investing in those young children. The future of this church, they're investing right now. Even further than that, then we've got the youth group. We've got all of the adult Sunday school, all of the adult uh, Wednesday night, the Wednesday night service, and we've got the young at heart, all together under one roof. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the definition of the church. It's unity. It's everyone here learning and instructing and inspiring and growing together under the banner of Christ Jesus. That's the idea of feed my sheep. I think that Peter is, the, is, a, is a wonderful example of what happens when he actually gets the idea of the construction of the church really down and under his belt. Because Peter was already told back in Matthew, and, and this is much earlier uh, in history, it, it's Matthew chapter... 15, Jesus tells Peter, and this is Matthew, uh, not 15, I'm sorry, it's chapter 16, Matthew 16 and verse 18, and I'll read it here. Jesus tells Peter these words. He says, I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's preaching to Peter right now that on him and those disciples, I'm building my church. But it doesn't get through to those disciples. It doesn't, they don't understand it doesn't get through to them. And I, I can't imagine um, being in this situation, but what I can do is I can imagine my own life. Because how many times does Jesus tell us to do something? And we don't, we, we don't hear it. Well, maybe we don't want to hear it. Because Jesus tells Peter, he tells them, that this is where I'm building my church, guys. But it takes them all the way till we see here in John for it to finally get through to them. Because finally we see Peter understands what Jesus is saying. Because if you want to see someone who's on fire for the Lord and who's building the church, you don't have to look any further than Peter in the book of Acts. Because he goes out and becomes one of the most uh, influential evangelists in the early church. Personally, I cannot express how much I look up to this man, Peter, because he finally understands after this conversation, he finally understands what his calling is in his life. We're in the construction business. We are building 
the church. Now Jesus says one more thing here in verse 19. Two words. Two words here. In John chapter 21 verse number 19. He says, follow me. And that brings it all full circle, guys. You talk about the rescue. You talk about the investing. You talk about the construction. Building the church. But what everything all boils back down to is follow Jesus. Follow the Lord. Because we can't even start taking the scripture. We can't even start taking it to the people who need it most until we ourselves are following the Lord. Follow me, Jesus says. So as I come to a close here this morning, I want to encourage all of y'all one thing. If you're sitting in this room and you're sitting on a pew and you realize I haven't been following the Lord like I should be. I haven't been investing in people. I haven't been taking the scripture and taking that rescue that Jesus is giving every person, that salvation. If I haven't been taking it to people and ultimately building a stronger church. Today, this morning, right now, is the time to begin following Jesus. Now, as we uh, approach this invitation, the altar will be open. I know we're going to sing one more song. If you feel called to invest, invest in this church, invest in the lives of this youth group, or in any other person in this room, or outside of this room, those who are sick that can't be here, or I know the nursing home ministry, such an amazing ministry that you can invest in people outside the church. If you feel called to begin a ministry we don't yet have, come forward during the invitation. Speak to any of the youth leaders. Mr. Jason's in the back. Pastor Eric's up front here. I'll be happy to listen to you too. Dennis is over here. Come to us. Tell us what you want to do. Tell us where you feel God leading you. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we're called to follow God. We're called to do this, to rescue, to invest, to build a stronger church in the future. Again, ladies and gentlemen, the altar's open if you feel so led. I'm going to close some prayer and then I know we've got one more song, so let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the the spirit that you've sent down to this room, God. Thank you for the youth group that's putting so many hours of practice and work, God. Thank you for every youth leader and every uh, person that's, that, that's given in their tithes and offerings to even uh, just pay for this building, to pay for the work that's being done here every Sunday, every Wednesday, and outside of these walls as we minister, we witness, and are a light to this community. So, Lord... I pray as we close out, God, that you'll keep your spirit on us as we go out into the world, that we can continue to take your scripture across the land, God, and remember that our job here, God, is to build the church. So thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. I say these things in your name.